Um, so my name is Johnny Cupcakes. Uh, my last name spells out cupcakes, but it's actually pronounced Kupkakis, and it's Portuguese. Uh, I'm just kidding. That's not my real last name. If, uh, if Cupcakes was my real last name, then my future daughter would be very promiscuous. So uh, I'm going to stick with my real last name, which is Earl. I like music. I like Wu-Tang Clan. I like oysters. I like Mario Kart 64. I like to floss my teeth all the time. I always keep one of these in my back pocket. I actually keep two in case I run out. Um, I like Home Alone. It's one of my favorite movies. But the people who live there now do not like me soliciting in front of their house. And I, uh, the only thing that I don't like is traffic. And growing up as a kid, I would see my parents um, really frustrated about their 9 to 5 job. But it was mostly the time that they wasted sitting in traffic every day, which was time that took away from them raising my little sister and I. So at a young age, I told myself, you know what, if I'm, someday I'm going to figure out a way to work for myself and, and uh, maybe start my own business and someday support my family. So at a young age, uh, this is me. Uh, not much has changed. I still have all those toys and I can still fit into those clothes. Uh, there's my family. There's my dad with his award-winning mustache. And that's me pretending to eat my little sister. And uh, my parents just raised me to not really care what anyone else thinks and to be myself, which you can see here. I kind of rolled out of bed and went to student photo day, and there I am. And uh, lastly, there's my little sister and I. So um, at a young age and to this day, I say, you know, do more of what makes you happy. Uh, it's very important. You know, life is pretty short, and it's good to be uh, independent or at least you know, if you're not going to work for yourself, at least find a company that makes you really happy. Um, so do more of what makes you happy, unless that's like drugs or prostitution or anything like that. You know what I mean? Follow your passion. Um, very, very important. And there's some people who complain so much, but it's almost like they're not happy unless they have something to complain about. And we're all guilty of having one of those friends. And if you are not guilty of having one of those friends, then you might be that friend. So, you know, try and set some goals. Follow your passion, a little step by step. And that's what I did at a young age. I started out by selling lemonade. I graduated to yard sales. Uh, when my family wasn't home, I'd sell my dad's old tools and my sister's My Little Ponies. I got in trouble, so I had to stop doing that. Um, winters rolled around. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and the winters are pretty crazy. We get a lot of snow. And as much as I love sledding, I chose to take a break to invest in a snow shovel and start making some extra money. Uh, as much as I love sledding, and I guess now you can kind of equate it, you know, as much as you love partying, it might be nice to take a step back and put 110% into a mini project to help raise some funds to put into another project. And that's what I did at a young age. Um, I could barely push the snow shovel, but this actually worked out to my advantage because people felt bad for me, so they gave me extra money as a tip. Um, and I, I really wanted to make some extra money because all of my winter gloves had holes in them because I wanted to be Freddy Krueger or uh, Wolverine, so I'd take my mom's vegetable skewers and I'd poke them through all of my winter gloves. Um, so I was like, I'm going to shovel snow, make some money. So I was getting paid $20 a driveway. If I could do five driveways in one day, that's $100 cash um, that the government doesn't even know about. So that's a lot of money, um, especially at that age. So I kept doing these little projects. Um, graduated to selling drinks up and down Nantasket Beach. I had no legal permits, but even the town police were excited that this little kid was making something out of nothing. Um, somehow I got into magic tricks. I was eight years old. My parents got me a magic kit, and I started doing magic shows at birthday parties. I get paid $20 a half hour just to do something that I was passionate about. Um, and, and this is one of my favorite things because I got to uh, curate an experience for people. And I think at the end of the day, when you have a business, a passion, a hobby, whatever it is you're doing, it's the experience that really separates you from everyone else. It's those little details and the, the non-tangible things, the things that make people have a feeling. Um, so this is an actual ad that my mom put in the newspaper for me for my birthday. Um, it's a cute advertisement when, when I'm a kid, but I'm 31 years old now. And if I put this in the newspaper now, it looks a little molesty. So my mom gave me a scrapbook for Christmas a couple years ago, and this was the actual newspaper article. Now, two things that were a little messed up is, uh, 
is actually one thing that's a little messed up is my mom would straight up drop me off at strangers' houses <laughs> that would call up on the newspaper ad. And I'm like, Mom, someday I'm really going to disappear. You can't just do that. So this was going good for a little while. And uh, this is an actual photo of my very first magic show. It was at my sister's birthday party. I remember every kid in this photo. I stopped hanging out with most of them because their parents were really mean. But um, I was so infatuated with the audience and the experience that I had to take a photo. Um, so before I forget, I'm going to take a photo of you guys right now for my blog. All right. So um, yeah, that was great. I loved it, and, and it made me realize that you can really do something that you love, and you can make money from it, and and be happy. And that was one of my, my favorite jobs that I did, and I still do it on the side sometimes. So throughout middle school, and, and uh, I, I had a, uh, a borderline learning disability. I had a really hard time focusing. I never took any drugs for it, uh, mostly because my parents couldn't afford them. And secondly, I didn't really believe in it. I believed that it wasn't really a learning disability. It was a superpower because I clearly knew what I did not want to do, which was like all of my homework. Um, <laughs> but if I did find something that I was passionate about, I would focus at 110%. I would almost obsess over things. It was like, you know, it was almost a form of OCD. And it didn't help my grades, though. So my parents were like, we got to put you in a charter school, this you know, special startup school. And I was like, oh, great. i got to take this funny little bus with all these funny little people. And then I realized that I was one of those funny little people, and everything was going to be all right. So I hopped in this bus. I went to the South Shore Charter School from 8th grade to, to 12th grade. And it was good for me, personally, because I had a hard time learning. And the, the smaller classrooms really helped. And I got to learn at my own level. And it was one of the best things that happened to me. Um, but there was no entrepreneurship classes back then. Um, a lot of things have changed. Back then, most people did not even know how to spell the word entrepreneurship, never mind say it. And uh, this was before social media. Um, but I was figuring out ways to, to make money the old-fashioned way. And, uh, and I still think that's important. It's good to have a balance of both. Um, but in eighth grade, with my, uh, with my learning difficulties, I still figured out a way to make some extra money at school. Um, the school did not have a yearbook, so I took my personal scrapbook and I turned it into the school's very first yearbook. Now, since I had little to no startup money, um, something that any of you guys can do with any idea, any project, whether it be big or small, is, uh, I'll, I'll, oh, this is me. This is, I called myself the editor, even though this consisted of no words. It was all photos except these words right here. Um, and I used to want to be a gangster, so I wore really big clothes because I thought it would make me be really tough, but it didn't, and I never really grew, so that's me. So if you have little to no startup money, a, a great solution is taking pre-orders, um, selling a product before it exists. It's a way to take a very calculated risk, um, and there's a few things that can help foster that and make it uh, successful. Timing really helps. Um, realizing that if you're going to push a product or a promotion that uh, you probably shouldn't promote it to somebody on a Monday because most people don't even want to look at anyone else on a Monday. Uh, people get paid at the end of the week, you know, so that really helps. Or doing it around the holidays when people are more apt to, to buy more gifts. Um, offering an incentive. Why is somebody going to give you money for a product or a service that doesn't even exist yet? Um, give them an incentive, a discount, or, or say, hey, if you purchase this now, I'll throw in some free stickers or it'll be a two for one. Um, really get them excited. Having a physical sample helps. It makes it less sketchy. You're not like, yo, give me money for this thing that doesn't exist yet. You could be like, this is what I'm offering. This is what I developed. It's coming out in a few months. Um, you know, do you want to support my project? Approach the right people and, uh, and approach people you know. Maybe you have a hard time soliciting your ideas to complete strangers, but you know, your friends, your family, your colleagues, your coworkers, all these people want to see you succeed. So that's a good way to test out your business and, and pitching your ideas is through, your, uh, through the people that you know. So in eighth grade, I was pre-selling these yearbooks. I made $2,000. It wasn't that bad. And, and again, it, it was a $1,500 cash profit, which was money that the government didn't even know about. So that was a lot of money back then. Um, 
And I, got in, I, I didn't get in trouble, but the school realized how much money I was making, so they decided to make their own yearbook, and I had to figure out something else to sell. Um, but I made a calculated risk. When I bought the yearbooks, when I ordered them, I knew exactly how many to order, and um, I knew exactly how much money I was going to be making. And if I didn't have that many pre-orders, that's fine, or I can you know, scrap everything and work a little bit harder, but it's a great way to test things out. Now there's websites like kickstarter.com and indiegogo.com, you know, great way to test out some of your ideas. Um, so I had to figure out what else can I do, and I was always a prankster. Um, Pee Wee Herman was one of my biggest role models um, before the whole movie theater thing, and, and after too, but I, I just, um, I love playing pranks on people, and I used to buy so many pranks from this one joke shop that the owner sat down with me and he said, listen, Johnny, I appreciate your business, but how would you like it if I told you you could get 144 whoopee cushions for the price of four retail whoopee cushions? I was like, whoa, that's a lot of whoopee cushions. I don't know what I'm going to do with them all, but that's a great deal. And that day I was introduced to the world of wholesale. I went home that day, I had two catalogs. One was Oriental Trading Company and the other one was Rhode Island Novelty. And next week when I went to school, I had all these whoopee cushions. Now when I was playing pranks on people, now I can say, that can be yours for a small price of $4.99. And most people would give me the middle finger or not support me because I embarrassed them in front of the whole classroom. But some people did buy my whoopee cushions. And I made enough money to pay for them all. So now I have over 100 whoopee cushions left. Anything I sell is a profit. And uh, you know, not too many people were buying them, so I would trade them. Um, I would trade them at lunch for other people's snacks. And then I'd take those snacks and I'd resell them to other people. So I had this cool little process going on. Um, and I still had a lot of whoopee cushions. So for the next couple years, um, all of my friends and family got a whoopee cushion for their birthday, for Christmas, for Easter, for, uh, for Valentine's Day. And uh, you know, they, I think they still have them too. I would reinvest that money. And now when you start a business, it's, a, it's attractive to to be like, cool, I made a bunch of money, now I can get my car fixed. Um, but you know what, sometimes you gotta drive with a loud muffler to, to, so you can keep reinvesting that money back into your ideas until you have a good cushion to spend some of that money on the things that you want or need. Um, so I was reinvesting my money back into my little business and I started purchasing itching powder, fart spray, stink bomb, switchblade combs. And I would resell all this stuff in school. I'd go up and down the hallway with my oversized Orlando Magic starter jacket with the pouch in the front. Um, I didn't even like sports back then, but I wanted to be a magician, and there was a jacket that said magic on it, so I got it. Music